Hello everyone, welcome to Better Tech. So today we have Eric with us. Hey Eric, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great. Nice to be here. A very happy new year to you. It's a wonderful start. Absolutely. So Eric, uh, we can, I mean, really officially get started. And in the start, if you can really give us a quick intro about yourself and your role, what are you up to these days? It will be a good start. Yeah, so my uh, role is on the product management side, which is a lot of figuring out what we're supposed to do and why those things matter. And the I'm a product manager of very technical products. In this case, Azul makes a Java, Java virtual machine that helps run people's applications because I come from a software development background. I was an engineer building systems for a long time. And then ultimately, as I built a lot of systems and wrote a lot of code, my big question was, why do people want this software and where is the where are the instructions that I'm getting coming from? So I charted this path down consulting, um, figured out what people want. And ultimately, I was brought into the product management fold where the company I was at said, do you want to take over product management? And I looked at them and I said, what's that? Mm -hmm. So, so Eric, I mean, what's your career progression looks like? You mentioned you started with software development and now you are into product management. And uh, you worked at large corporations, you have worked at mid-sized companies, you have worked at startups. So, I mean, can you walk us through a, your journey in like summary? Yeah, so product management is ultimately the uh, major career arc in a lot of other paths. Like to be a good, strong product manager, you need a, a very solid route in either engineering to understand how things are built in sales to understand what people want to buy, not what you want to sell them, because those are very different aspects, or how to market really well. And between the three of them, um, the stronger product managers tend to come from engineering or sales. Um, so I'm fortunate to have a really solid background in how things are built. So I apply that market, uh, that understanding to what are the things that people actually want, and why do they want to solve those particular problems? problems. Sure. So, I mean, as you worked at large enterprises and startups, I mean, what's, what's the difference you have felt in your career? I mean, are large organizations more process oriented? Are startups more lean? I mean, what are your oh. thoughts? Yeah, definitely. So between the two, um, I got my start in small companies and startups. Um, and I've been with some of those companies that have gone through IPOs. Uh, Norvax became Go Health. They IPO'd a couple years ago. Uh, Fortify Software was sold to Hewlett or was bought by Hewlett Packard. Um, that's when I kind of got my start in the large companies. Um, between the different styles in a startup land, you have significantly more autonomy to figure out what your role is and expand your wings a little bit. Once you get into larger organizations, they tend to be more process oriented. We have very specific things that we want to happen. We have a very set number of ways to do it. Um, so one of the ways I've found to kind of grow in the larger companies is to apply that knowledge that you learned in Startup Land to figure out what works and adapt very quickly and figure out where maybe those large company processes need to change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. All right. So uh, currently, I mean, with Azul, I hope I'm pronouncing the company name right. I mean, what's what's your role right now? I mean, I, I understand it's in the product management space, but what what your work day looks like? Right. So what I'm responsible for in Azul is uh, figuring out how to help people secure their Java applications. So my role is because I have a very strong background of application security, of how application security works, how applications are attacked and defended. Azul for about 20 years now has created a very powerful, very fast Java virtual machines that helps people run their applications at lower cost. So my day is looking out 
at the way that people run their Java applications, talking with them about how they run their software, what they do, and then figure out how we can help them apply good software security practices into what they're already doing. So we take about that last decade of learnings from what's worked in application security, and we figure out how to automate that just as a natural part of running a Java application. So I figure those things out. Then I have to communicate with the engineers to figure out um, how the problem is understood and also what are the ways that we're going to solve it. So how how the uh, Azure JDK or I mean JRE as, as we can call it or I mean Java Virtual Machine different from the conventional one? Right. So there's a number of Java virtual machines. Like when people go to build or an, a Java application, or when you go to run a Java application, the first thing that you need to do is to get that Java runtime environment that lets your software work. And at that point, you have your choice of several different Java vendors. Um, you can certainly use the old Oracle one. There are reasons to do that. There are many reasons not to do that. Or you can choose the Azul one where you have a company that's been in the Java space for about 20 years, supports uh, an even larger number of Java versions, like we still have support for Java 6, Java 7, Java 8. Um, so if you use Azul, you get support for more Java versions. And if you use the Azul Prime Java virtual machine, you get one that is um, significantly faster than the alternatives. So you can run your applications better response times at lower cost. So, I mean, implementing these security-based things in, in Java code, I mean, the, the solution does offer like an SDK or something which, which can be incorporated in in the Java code as an API for securing the applications or the, or the runtime does it by itself? Yeah, so with security, the best thing that you can do is to move it into the background so that people don't have to think or they don't have to interact with it or they just interact with it on the consumption of results. Mm -hmm. um, people don't need another security step in their process because there's a major risk in the supply chain now of when people get code. When you Even when you write your own application, how do you interact with those libraries that come in through your supply chain? So what we're really trying to do here is to make security simply a byproduct of running your application, not a whole nother set of steps that you need to staff, not a whole set of things that you need to scan and act on. People, everyone runs their software. How do we make software secure simply by running it? Mm -hmm. So so then, I mean, how, how does it work? I mean, is it like, uh, like security is at the foundation or at the core, as you have said? Now, what sort of security is currently in place if we use Azul's JDK? Right. So the Log4j problem of uh, last yeah. December back in um, 2020. One, um, that was when that vulnerability came out, it revealed a problem in the, the industry that when that library was vulnerable, that library was deployed in a huge number of locations. Um, Montreal, for example, had to just shut down a huge portion of their digital footprint because they didn't know where Log4j was or wasn't. So when software is vulnerable, people don't necessarily know where that software or those libraries are because you have a large supply chain problem. So the first step that we've looked to solve automatically with the Azul JRE is how do you track your software to know what you have so that when a vulnerability appears, you know exactly where that is. Um, because when a lot of people spent, you know, more than a month remediating Log4j, most of that time was them going around and saying, I don't know where this thing is, so I'm going to look everywhere. Sure, sure. I, I get it. I get it. All right. So, so I mean, security is one thing. I mean, what other benefits uh, Azul JDK basically brings on the table as, as compared to like the open JDK or other JDKs out there? Right. So Azul is fully compatible. There's an open JDK standard and specification, and we're fully compatible with that. It's called the test compatibility kit. So you can drop these aspects in and they perform and behave exactly the same. 
but there are differences in them. And you look at what everyone wants. You look in software, you know, it's a field that's constantly changing that we're constantly adapting. Let's look at what doesn't change in the field of software. And the things that don't change is people want to run their applications faster. They want to run their applications cheaper. They want to drive up density and they want to drive throughput. So what Azul has focused on, the specific thing that the, the main Azul Java implementation is really good at is being really fast. And we do that through having a really fast garbage collector. And we do that by having a really fast just-in-time compiler that produces better code on the machine. So from that, you can run your workloads faster and you can run more workloads on the same machine by higher density. So you touched upon the topic of using libraries. Um, I mean, you mentioned the log for you and there are many other libraries out there. So, so within Azul, I mean, since it's like a JRE, several libraries can still be bundled in, uh, in your Java applications. So, I mean, is there like some process within Azul which basically check for these vulnerabilities or it's like more of a passive approach where something when comes up, it gets flagged and then taken care of? How does that work? Right. So in terms of figuring out where your applications are vulnerable, step one is you have to have an inventory of what libraries you're using on your application. And mm -hmm. that's a step, a step where a lot of organizations don't actually have it. They might have an inventory of applications they run, but what are the libraries that are a part of that application? So before you can even tell people what's vulnerable, you have to be tracking that continuous inventory of what code do I have and where is it? Later on, software is determined to be vulnerable at, uh, at different times, like a vulnerability could come out today. So the first thing that I would want to do is to look back and say, do I have this piece of software that's known to be vulnerable? If I do, where is that? So I apply the security knowledge of today for what's vulnerable to look back across my supply chain. Has this vulnerable software come in anywhere? I learned that it's vulnerable today. So do I have it anywhere and does it affect me? And the benefit that you get from having that is you know exactly where to go to deal with that software and you know exactly what to do. You're not left like a lot of organizations were of just kind of scrambling around to say, you know, I don't know where this software is. Or maybe you have a scanner. Maybe you have one of the composition analyzers that a lot of people use. You, you don't scan everything. You don't scan typically your vendor software or the component infrastructure software. And even if you scan it, oftentimes that you lose track of where that software has actually gone. So we give you a continuous inventory of what you're using, not mm -hmm. just what you think you're using. Yeah, because many times what happens is that if you include like one library, then there are many other artifacts that they just come as a part of Gradle or Maven build and you end up having like a war or an or an ER or I mean other library standards where I mean, you have libraries of the whole world and they are just referred and not used anywhere. Yeah, you have a lot of these libraries that come in through what's called a transitive dependency where maybe you think you're not using log4j. Well, it turns out you use a library that uses a library that uses a, a vulnerable version of log4j. So therefore, you're actually impacted. And so some there are different ways that people can scan an application to say, is log4j there or is a vulnerable version of a library there? There's different ways that you can scan it, but what you have, what you miss out on is the fact that some Java code that's present in your application is actually inert because you never load it. So when you go and you report that this software is vulnerable, you have this library right here. If you don't have the runtime context that tells, do you actually use this library? Then you set a lot of people off on this false positive goose chase where they have to go and every alert is at the same volume and you can't prioritize the alerts of which of these vulnerabilities actually affect me because it's a risk and I actually load that code. So the result is a lot of wasted time. And we give you that context to save that time and actually go to where it matters. So uh, for Azul, I mean, uh, the question really is that you have been working with the companies of all scales and sizes. So you must be working with bootstrap startups, you might be working with Fortune 10 companies. So what's sort of in your experience, some of the major uh, issues that you have seen in implementation and consulted with the clients you are responsible for? 
Right. So every company needs their software to run really fast and they just want to be able to rely on it. I think that's one of the consistent points of whether you're a startup or whether you're a Fortune 10 company, you need to build on top of that reliable software. There was that statement from Zuckerberg years ago that said, move fast and break things. And he finally changed that to move fast with stable infra. So Java yeah. is effectively infrastructure level software that people need to rely on. Um, and there's just different skill levels across those gamuts. So a lot, uh, Azul is used by 10 of the world's top 10 trading companies because it's extremely fast. So it lets Java be used in those fast areas where um, time is money because you're trading on information. Um, those companies tend to have more people who can be dedicated to do a lot of very deep fine tuning. So we give them extremely detailed levers that they can control to fully optimize every single thing. Within the startup, that's maybe two or three people working in their garage, hoping that they can get joined by uh, person number four and five. They just want to focus on building what's distinctive for them. So they just want a fast, stable base of Java to build on top of because they're hoping that they can one day get to, to have that super deep knowledge person. But the small startups are really focused on the concept of product market fit. So what yeah. we do is we take the burden of them of uh, getting a deep Java expertise, and we just help them be fast and reliable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. All right. Yeah. So you mentioned one more thing that uh, your runtime is faster as compared to others. So, I mean, can you talk to us a bit about that? I mean, how it is faster as compared to other runtimes out there? Right. So there's a couple ways that it's faster. One uh, is the concept of Java garbage collection, where there used to be a joke of, you know, knock, knock. And then, you know, person says, who's there? And you would pause for a moment and you would pause and you would just kind of hold that there while the person looked at you and they got frustrated waiting for the punchline. And then you would say Java. Because other non-Azul Java implementations will pause and kind of wait, and they'll have a stop the world garbage collector, which impacts your performance. So Azul's uh, in Azul Prime is a pause-less garbage collector that doesn't stop the world and lets your application keep moving. The other way that uh, our JVM is faster is through a just-in-time compiler that produces better native code for the CPU to run. So when you have better native code that's direct CPU instructions, you can run faster because you're doing less work with fewer instructions. So it's those two aspects that give you the, the primary performance boost so that you can achieve your application's peak speed significantly faster. Sure. Sure. So, I mean, right now, I mean, we are moving towards uh, the conclusion. So any sort of message that you would like to uh, give out to Java developers out there, because Java is a language, I mean, which has like one of the most developed community of developers across the globe. I mean, I would say that there are more Java developers in the world as compared to any other language out there. So, yeah. so I mean, what, what would be your suggestion or message to them to keep their application secure in general? If, I mean, whether or not they are using Azul or not, I mean, what would be some of the best practices? Right. So it's really important to not just focus on speed and not just focus on making the application very fast. Like, yes, that's something that we want to do, but I've seen a lot of people whose applications go fast and I made a joke that they should add to their release notes. Now hackers can steal our data 300% faster. And the, the reason is that's just a humorous thing that people don't want going in their release notes. So in terms of paying attention to security, you know, that's kind of the goal, but we have to clarify what that means. So right now there's something called a uh, software bill of materials, which is literally just, can you explain what's in your software? And the reason is when a new vulnerability is detected, we want to be able to pick out how that software is actually vulnerable. So step one is um, continuously assess the bill of materials that's in your software. It's not something you produce just once, like as a vendor of the application, yes, but each time you change it, that bill of materials changes. So we're left with kind of two phases. One, do we as developers of applications want to continuously do all the work ourselves or do we want to automate that work so that it happens for our use, so that our users get it automatically? 
the, over the years, there's been this goal of shift security left. Uh, it's really nice to shift security left, but you can't just take things away from the right, which left is development, right is deployment. And left is where the developers have to do work every time. So when they change something, they have to produce it. But ultimately, we need to monitor our applications also to just verify that they are what we think they are. Because otherwise, you end up with this one bill of materials that's totally different from what you're using. And that's a supply chain problem because the thing that you think you have is not the thing that you actually have. So from like coming from a security standpoint or maintenance in general, what do you think? I mean, what do you think about technical debt in general? So, I mean, we have seen applications uh, which keeps on transferring from one generation of developers to another one and they keep on building on the same um, legacy code, which is sort of already at a weak spot. So what in your experience have you observed from a technical debt standpoint? Right. So there, there's legacy code. And of course, nobody wants to work on legacy code. But the simple fact is legacy code is often the revenue generating code. Absolutely. And yes. if you go and you just say, well, that code's legacy, you can't declare something legacy unless you have a way to move off of it. Um, so you don't rewrite things. What you do is you refactor them to start breaking things out because there's always going to be that new generation of developers. And for people who are senior in their career, maybe they're an architect, maybe they're a product manager, maybe they're a fine leader, you need to be bringing in new people uh, at all the time. And what you need to do is to be able to train those new people of how do they get up to speed on the system. And the smaller their things are, the better. So what I would do, instead of just saying that's legacy code, how do we refactor that into something that's easier to work on and share between people who have that historical knowledge and people who need to build that knowledge up in order to advance their own career. So, I mean, in the end, I would really like to ask you like what your personal and career aspirations look like and where do you see Azul moving forward? Right. So the big thing that I want to be able to do is to make software defend and secure itself. Um, I've been doing application security for over 10 years now, um, and it's it's a lot of work, but my main vision and where I want to take Azul in the future is the concept that software should help secure itself. It shouldn't be a whole set of expert-based steps that we have to do every time. So my main goal of where I want to take us and what I want to get to in kind of the next five years is uh, making it so that when you run a Java application, it's much easier to secure it than it is today, which will lead to a, a stop in data loss, a significant decrease in the number of breaches that occur. And one of the reasons is that it's much, it's too hard to secure a modern application because there are too many assets. Why are why is security and running software a separate step? They should merge to become the same step. So the real kind of innovation that I'm working on is the concept of removing steps, not adding another security step to your mm. pipeline, but making you get it automatically without any additional work. Sure, that's awesome. So Eric, in the end, I would like to really thank you for taking out the time and uh, sharing your wisdom with the, with me and the audience. And I look forward to hosting you again with another, another exciting topic in the near future. Sounds great. Thank you very much for the time. Thanks. Have a good one, Eric. Bye.